Good afternoon. It's a, a real, uh, a great pleasure being here. Uh, although for a very short time uh, in the company, uh, not only of friends, but people who really uh, inspire me a lot. Uh, this is not to reciprocate the, the kind words of Professor Pallad, but I really mean it. Uh, uh, what I learned about uh, empathy in the first place uh, mostly come from the famous anthology that Professor Margrave, uh, together with Economo, published in the second half of um, the 80s of last century. And uh, the writing of both Sara and Iwani were really uh, uh, important in convincing me that uh, architecture uh, could be a, a field of possible mutual uh, uh, interest and uh, cross-fertilization and eventually lead to some empirical work in the near future, hopefully. This is going to be uh, 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 the outline of, uh, of my talk today. I would like to start by framing my approach uh, with uh, um, some framing of the notion of art and uh, aesthetics as can be addressed empirically from someone like me, from, from a cognitive neuroscientist. Then I will briefly introduce the notion of empathy and its role in aesthetic experience. Then I will move on in challenging uh, what has been so far common wisdom in uh, cognitive neuroscience, and not only in cognitive neuroscience, namely the idea that uh, uh, everything we see has to do uh, with the workings of uh, uh, a specifically devoted part of our brain, which is the visual system, which falls short, unfortunately, uh, 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 to capture the real essence uh, of our vision, which is a multimodal enterprise, then I will quickly uh, review some of our research dealing with the way we perceive space, objects, and the actions of uh, other individuals to uh, reach some uh, obviously temporary conclusions. Um, this is a highly uh, uh, debated issue. Um, are we entitled as neurobiologists uh, to talk about uh, uh, art, to talk about aesthetic experience, according to the people who recognize themselves in the cultural approach, the answer is no. You, you should stay away of that. Why? Because it's culture all the way down, so biology has nothing to say uh, relevant, interesting. However, there is an alternative to this very strict uh, uh, view of things, uh, what can be loosely defined as a biocultural approach. And basically, the biocultural uh, approach uh, recognizes that uh, human nature is at the center of uh, art, of uh, aesthetics, of language, of anything that uh, really distinguishes us among uh, uh, the other living creatures uh, living in this planet. So it includes the evolved cognitive, motor, perceptual, and emotional hardware that we share uh, cross-culturally. And uh, Gumbrecht, I think, uh, present a rather balanced view uh, uh, on these issues. Uh, I, I read uh, uh, from his book, The Production of Presence, What Meaning Cannot Convey. Uh, he's a German scholar since many years at Stanford University. Every human contact with the things of the world contains both a meaning and a presence component. The situation of aesthetic experience is specific in as much as it allows us to link both these components in their tension. So it seemed to acknowledge that there is room, perhaps, uh, to a, a naturalization of uh, aesthetic experience. But what about art? I am becoming more and more reluctant to use this notion. Maybe I read too much of this guy, <laughs> among others. Tim Ingold is a, a British anthropologist, very well known in Finland too. I, th I think he spent much of his uh, field work uh, in Lapland. Uh, this book was published in 2000, The Perception of the Environment. We can now see how by adopting a dwelling perspective, a word that uh, we heard already in uh, Sarah's um, presentation, which is heavily influenced by Heidegger. Uh, that is, by taking the animal in its environment rather than the self-contained individual 
as our point of departure, it is possible to dissolve the orthodox dichotomies between evolution and history and between biology and culture. So I think we move a little forward, even with respect to the perspective uh, uh, proposed by Dewey, uh, at least in some of the last slide that uh, Sarah presented, when he was claiming that history and biology <coughs> should be, uh, or at least that's the way I got it. Hunters and gatherers of the past were painting and carving, but they were not producing art. We must cease thinking of painting and carving as modalities of the production of art and view art instead as one rather peculiar and historically very specific objectification of the activities of painting and carving. And I like this so much because I'm a cognitive neuroscientist who started uh, working in this business by exploring the functional organization of the motor system. So anyone in the humanities that brings up uh, any even remote uh, a mention of uh, the performative quality of our cultural life, I think, um, uh, contributes uh, um, further to the possibility to uh, join uh, the efforts uh, bringing together people from the humanities and uh, neurobiology. And another very interesting perspective is that uh, uh, provided by Ellen Dissanayek. Uh, a comprehensive scientific understanding of art must include its manifestation in all human culture. A big limitation of uh, um, cognitive neuroscience uh, is the fact that we practically presume to uh, give a picture of the human brain and the relationship between the human brain and the human mind, mainly focusing on the brain of uh, our volunteers that in 99% of the, uh, the cases are undergraduate students of the first West world, which probably falls short of providing a, 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 a comprehensive account of, of, of what uh, a human being as such is all about. A further element of interest coming from the Senayeki contribution is the following. This forces us to consider the arts as behaviors they may have no necessary connection with beauty. Most of the efforts of cognitive neuroscience uh, while addressing art and aesthetics uh, uh, have been focusing on the uh, search for a house in the brain of our sense of beauty. Beside the fact that our sense of beauty is uh, incredibly culturally determined, so before reaching any conclusion about the possible relationship between our sense of beauty and the brain, we should uh, uh, promote uh, um, this sort of investigation well beyond the limit of the first uh, Western world, uh, unless if we want uh, those data uh, to have some uh, universal validity uh, uh, that can be applied to all human beings. Uh, I'm not questioning that this is an interesting enterprise. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, my, uh, my take on this issue is uh, is rather different. I'm more interested uh, in uh, deconstructing, uh, uh, in unpacking uh, the notion of experience in the first place, and in particular, in unpacking the notion of the experience of uh, uh, specific perceptual objects that we now call uh, uh, object of design, architecture, or uh, visual artworks, movies, and the like. So I, I, I don't speak of neuroesthetics, not because I don't like Samir Zeke. I think he, Samir Zeke is probably the best vision neuroscientist. Uh, we had much of what we know about uh, the visual part of the brain comes from his research, even more than from the contribution of Hubel and Beza. Uh, so Samir uh, uh, decided to study uh, aesthetic in that particular sense. Um, I'm starting with the definition of aesthetics used mainly in its bodily account according to its etymology from aesthesis, which deals with the uh, sensitivity of our body. Um, so referring basically to the sensory motor and affective features of our experience of these uh, perceptual objects. So my goal, together with my colleagues uh, in a word, consists in using cognitive neuroscience to study the functional relation between 
the brain body system and aesthetic experience why do uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy to say the brain because I think that uh, if we consider the brain in isolation from the body uh, we, 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 we we start uh, uh, with the wrong assumption. I'm an MD, I'm a neurologist, and uh, I think my background uh, uh, make me uh, address uh, empirically the investigation of the brain from a, a very different point of view uh, with respect to someone who has a different background. So the brain and the body should never be uh, um, torn apart. We can now look at the aesthetic, symbolic dimension of human existence, not only from hermeneutic or semiotic perspective, but starting from the dimension of uh, bodily presence. And here today we have some of the pioneers uh, in this uh, investigation. The contribution of cognitive neuroscience is meant to be complementary to the humanistic approach by enriching our perspective with a new level of description. I, uh, to be very clear, I think that uh, whenever we want to better understand who we are, in, in this specific case, we want to shed new light on human culture, the level of description of the brain body is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Uh, so I don't think we can say anything uh, uh, interesting uh, if what we say contradicts what we know about the function of the brain, but the brain in itself falls short of uh, uh, accounting uh, for our diversified social and cultural activities. So we need uh, uh, to carry on this uh, investigation in close collaboration with people who are expert uh, in philosophy, in uh, aesthetics, uh, architecture, field theory, uh, narratology, and the like, which is what I've been doing, uh, by the way, in the last 20 years. And it is also very rewarding. I mean, it's rewarding uh, not only because it helps you in framing uh, new empirical approaches, but also because even if you are not up to investigating art or aesthetics, it enormously enriches your perspective even when you are about to investigate more trivial issues like uh, how does my hand knows uh, how to reach uh, a glass in order to have a sip of beer or vodka? Um, this level of description, the level of description provided by cognitive neuroscience, can help analyzing and revising, perhaps sometimes, several concepts we normally use when referring to intersubjectivity, aesthetics, art, and architecture, as well as when referring to the experience we make. And uh, this is a famous question which I learned uh, after reading uh, Harry Margrave from Heinrich Wölflin uh, PhD dissertation in 1886. How is it possible that architectural forms are able to express an emotion or a mood? And here comes the answer provided by Wölflin, <laughs> which sounds incredibly modern to me um, in light of what we know about the brain. Physical forms possess a character only because we ourselves possess a body. If we were purely visual beings, we would always be denied an aesthetic judgment of the physical world. But as human beings with a body that teaches us the nature of gravity, contraction, strain, and so on, we gather the experience that enables us to identify with the conditions of other forms. This was written almost 100 years before uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson published their most influential book, uh, Metaphors We Live By, where they uh, started a, a theoretical investigation uh, on the relationship between body and uh, uh, the most abstract usage of, of language. So my approach of, to experimental aesthetics in, in, in few words, the notion of empathy recently explored by cognitive neuroscience can reframe the problem of how artworks and architectural spaces are experienced, revitalizing and empirically validating, eventually, all the intuitions on the relationship between body empathy and aesthetic experience. Empathy is an almost unusual uh, word as we speak. Why? Because it uh, uh, became uh, polysemic. 
Uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, Tanya Singer and uh, Frédéric de Vignemont, in a review they published in 2006, wrote that there are probably as many people, uh, there are as many definitions of empathy as many are the people using this concept. And this slide portrays some of the uh, um, concepts that people refer to when using the word empathy, theory of mind, perspective taking, cognitive empathy, true empathy, emotional contagion, which has nothing to do with empathy, identification, and one could continue. So let's go to the root of the word, to the root of the word of the German word that was later on translated by Tichner uh, with the word empathy, Einfühlung, filling in. This guy, I changed this image for a long time. I, 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 I found plenty of pictures of his father, uh, Thomas Vischer, who was also a distinguished philosophy professor in Germany. But I finally got this picture um, through the help of a friend of mine who is in aesthetics, Professor Andrea Pinotti from the University of Milan. Uh, here, so the, the usage of the notion of empathy in psychology uh, occurred much later on, and it was mainly Theodore Lips who uh, used this notion to apply to um, social relationships. Here we are dealing with what happens when I stand in front of a three-dimensional object, a painting, a fresco, a sculpture. And Vichel wrote, I transpose myself into the inner being of the object and then explore its former character from within, as it were. This kind of transposition can take a motor or sensitive form even when it is concerned with lifeless and motionless forms. And here's uh, Husserl pupil, uh, Edith Stein, who wrote in turn her own PhD dissertation on the problem of empathy. And here we, we dispel many misconceptions. People normally, as we speak, tend to confuse empathy uh, with sympathy. Uh, we should kept uh, uh, um, separated. I, I think you can't be sympathetic if you are not empathic, but you can be empathic without being sympathetic. To be empathic uh, means to feel with someone, while to be sympathetic uh, means to feel for someone. So we are dealing with different aspects of our sociality. Uh, a further interesting element coming from uh, uh, the take uh, of uh, Edith Stein on empathy is that empathy is by, by all means not confined to emotion and feelings, but it also incorporates action. The other is experienced as another human being, uh, uh, apology for the typo, uh, being like us through the perception of a similarity relation and she systematically referred to action as a way to appreciate uh, similarity and here is Sigmund Freud, um, inhibition symptoms and anxiety. It is only by empathy that we know the existence of psychic life other than our own. So why someone like me should bother investigating uh, uh, aesthetic experience? In the first place, being a reductionist. In the second place, being someone who is dealing uh, in the last 10, 50 years uh, mostly with intersubjectivity. Well, because we can consider aesthetic experience as a form of mediated intersubjectivity. This is a quote from the novel writer Shiri Hustvedt. She is originally from Norway, but she was born and educated in the United States. She's a very famous novel writer. She's the uh, wife of Paul Oster, but she's also a very good essayist. And this is a beautiful book, Mysteries of the Rectangle, on air reading of some, some famous paintings, where she wrote, in art, the meeting between viewer and thing implies intersubjectivity. The intersubjectivity inherent in looking at art means that it is a personal, not an impersonal act. So, aesthetic experience as a mediated form of intersubjectivity. And let me come to quickly to the brain. So, first of all, against the visual brain imperialism. What do I mean by that? Observing the world of others cannot be reduced to the mere activation of the so-called visual brain, as it implies a multimodal notion of vision. Observing the world, as we will see in a minute, encompasses the activation of motor, somatosensory, and emotion-related components, 
within the larger frame of the intrinsic intentional, pragmatic nature of every uh, relation with the world. This is a side view of the macaque monkey brain. When I started being interested in the brain as a medical undergraduate student, there was nothing of this kind. Here you would have seen M1, primary motor cortex, and in front of it an homogeneous gray area called Brodmann Area 6, which was considered to be a boring extension of the primary motor cortex in charge of controlling the less interesting, uh, from a cognitive point of view, muscles of our body, the actual and the proximal muscles, not even the mouth or, or the hand. Uh, the picture changed mostly because of the research being done at our department, guided by Giacomo. Uh, the motor cortex is not a uniform field, as you just saw, but a mosaic of functionally distinct areas. Each of these premotor areas is reciprocally connected with distinct regions in the parietal cortex, and the premotor cortex is therefore part of a series of parallel functional networks. But what is even more interesting from a functional point of view is that cortical motor areas are not just purely motor, but they are endowed with sensory properties. They contain motor neurons. They are motor because their activation produces movement. If you microstimulate electrically those uh, very same neurons, you evoke movement, but they also respond to visual, tactile, and auditory stimuli. On the other hand, posterior parietal areas that are reciprocally connected with these premotor areas, traditionally considered to be associative areas, in charge of associating uh, within a more coherent perceptual frame uh, uh, the data coming from the individual sensory modalities, we now know they play a major role in model control. So let me quickly go through some of the properties of these premotor neurons. This is uh, uh, area F4. The motor properties of the neurons sitting there are the following. They control arm reaching and orienting or avoiding uh, movements of the head. But, interestingly enough, the very same neuron that control the reaching movement uh, of the macaque also respond to tactile stimuli applied to the very same arm, uh, here depicted as a, a gray shaded area, and also respond to visual stimuli moved within this uh, um, geometrical solid within the space surrounding that very same body part. So when the neuron fires, it produces a reaching movement, but when the monkey is still, if you touch the arm or if you move something toward the arm, you still uh, have the response of the very same neuron. And, uh, so how do these neurons perceptually work? My interpretation is they do it by means of embodied motor simulation. Seeing or hearing, because uh, a group at Yale University, uh, um, Charlie Gross and Michael Graziano, demonstrated that even in the dark, auditory stimuli, provided they come from this uh, uh, a solid anchor to the body part whose movement is controlled by the neuron can evoke the discharge of the very same neuron. So seeing or hearing an object or an event at a given location within peripersonal space evokes the motor simulation of the most appropriate acts towards that very same spatial location. And in a way, we are selling uh, uh, an old wine in a new bottle. Um, I'll tell you why in a minute. But this is important because, okay, it's not only a monkey business. <laughs> uh, we have the very same neuron in our brain, and this is one of the many uh, uh, brain imaging experiments from the group of Frank Bremer, demonstrating a similar network linking parietal, VIP, and S2, and premotor, ventramotor, premotor cortex areas responding uh, to auditory, tactile, and visual stimuli provided they are in register with the body part uh, this brain area produces uh, the movement of. While an old wine in a new bottle, Phenomenology of Perception, Merleau-Ponty, 1945, space is not a sort of ether in which all things flow. The points in space mark in our vicinity the varying range of our aims and our gestures. So this is uh, uh, a way of uh, thinking about the relationship between the brain-body system and the way we map space, space around us, 
in pragmatic uh, motor terms. If we move a little forward, we find this other premotor area, area F5, where there are neurons like this. Um, they are selective for a particular kind of grasping. So, for example, this neuron doesn't fire when the monkey grasps a plate, a cube, a cone, a sphere, or a cylinder, only when the monkey inserts the index finger in a small ring and uh, uh, in order to pull it uh, to get the reward. But, interestingly enough, in another set of trials where the monkey is explicitly instructed not to move, but just to look at the spatial position where this object will appear moved by a round table, a turntable, sorry, um, so that the monkey cannot predict which kind of object we'll see next. So the monkey is perfectly clear that he, she's not required to uh, perform any movement. Still, the very same neuron that control the grasping of this object will also be active by the mere sight of the very same object. So, how do F5 canonical neurons perceptually work, again, by means of embodied simulation? Seeing a manipulable object evokes the motor simulation of its grasping of something you can, uh, that particular object affords. So, in a way, we are dealing with the neural correlate of the notion of affordance originally proposed by Gibson. Seeing the object evokes an object-related motor potentiality. And finally, in the very same area, while we were studying this specific type of neurons, we discovered uh, mirror neurons that from a motor point of view are identical to the one I showed you before. What changes is the, the perceptual stimulus that typically leads this neuron to fire is not the observation of an object, it's the observation of an action, of an action that uh, the more is similar to the one uh, that is controlled in its execution by the, the same neuron will lead the, the very same neuron to fire, to be activated. Um, this is a more recent experiment that tells you the social balance of this mechanism. Uh, my colleagues were interested in learning how, whether and how the distance between the observer, the monkey, and the agent, the experimenter, modulates the discharge of mirror neurons. So they were testing mirror neurons first, having the monkey doing the grasp. We want to make sure that this is a motor neuron. And then the monkey was observing the experimenter either grasping within or outside uh, its own peripersonal space. So does the distance between observer and agent make a difference? For 50% of the neuron tested with this paradigm, it doesn't. For the remaining 50%, it does. Half of them respond only when the observed action occurs far away from the observing monkey. The remaining 50%, 25% respond only when the observed action occurs close to the but what is more interesting is that these neurons do not code the distance between the agent uh, and the observer because in such a situation, so when the neuron uh, responds when the observed action occurs far away but not when it occurs uh, close uh, to the monkey uh, or the other way around, uh, uh, it uh, responds when the action occurs close but not or when the action occurs far away. In this particular case, if you position a transparent plexiglass barrier between the monkey and uh, uh, the uh, experimenter so that the observed action occurs at the very same location, but the possibility for the monkey to interact with the human experimenter, say, stealing away uh, uh, the object, uh, it's impossible exactly as it was when the action occurred far away. So they seem to map not the physical distance, but the possibility for an interaction between agent and observer. So mirror neurons for action are modulated by proxemics, as the potentiality for interaction between agent and observer measured by the distance separating them can affect the intensity of the discharge of mirror neurons in the observer's brain. 
So just to recap, frontoparietal motor areas are neurally integrated, not only to control action, but also to serve the function of building an integrated bodily formatted representation. We are dealing here with representation that do not require the use of language. Locations to which actions are directed, objects being acted upon, or the actions of others. Quickly, mirror neurons in humans, these are the brain areas, the colorful one, that turn out to be activated uh, uh, when you perform or you observe the performance done by someone else of object-directed action, communicative action, body movements. I don't have time to uh, address what is different between macaque and humans, but if, if, if you're curious about I can do it in question time. So the prolonged activation of the neural representation of motor content in the absence of movement likely defines, this is a very strong point, the experiential backbone of what we perceive or imagine perceiving. This allows a direct apprehension of the relational quality linking space, objects, and others' actions to our body. The primordial quality turning space, objects, and behavior into intentional objects is their constitution as the objects of the motor intentionality our body's motor potentialities express. And I didn't want to mention too much touch because I thought uh, Sarah would have covered that part. But anyway, here you have condensed in one slide the first two experiments that we did uh, in collaboration with Bruno Vica, Christian Cases, Leonardo Fogassi, and others on emotion and sensation. So this was the first demonstration that the very first part of your brain that is active when you subjectively uh, experience a given emotion like disgust is activated also by the observation of disgust as expressed by the facial mimicry of someone else, which is the anterior insula. To the right, the, the experiment we published in 204 demonstrating that uh, so far, considered mainly tactile area, the second somatosensory area, which is burned within the opercular part of the parietal cortex, is activated not only when my legs, for example, are touched, but also when I see the legs of someone else being touched. So I don't speak anymore of mirror neurons, also because speaking of mirror neurons, it induces into people the idea that these are sp sp special cells kind of magic cells. What is special is not the neuron in itself. They don't look different. They, are not, they don't look smarter than <laughs> other neurons, or bigger, or stronger, or more colorful. What is distinguished this neuron from all other neurons is the mechanism they exhibit, they, they instantiate. And the mechanism, in turn, is the outcome of the specific connectivity they entertain. No man is an island, no neuron is. The property of each neuron are the outcome of the integration that specific neuron uh, perform of all the input that uh, variously receives. So I prefer to speak of a mechanism. So this mechanism maps the sensory representation of the action, emotion, or sensation of another onto the perceiver's own motor, visceromotor, or somatosensory, bodily formatted representation of that action, emotion, or sensation. And this mapping enables one to perceive the action, emotion, or sensation of another in a certain sense. The distinction here is, is, is pretty complex. As if she were performing that action or experiencing that emotion or sensation herself, up to a certain limit, of course. So what do we want to explain with this model? We want to explain the mirror mechanism, but also related phenomena like F4 neurons, like canonical neurons, manipulable object vision, mental imagery, the representation of peripersonal space, and various aspects of language I won't deal uh, uh, today for sake of concision. So body simulation is also triggered during the experience of spatiality around our body and during the contemplation of objects. So the functional architecture of embodied simulation seems to constitute the basic characteristic of our brain making possible our rich and diversified experiences of space, objects, and other individuals being at the basis of our capacity to empathize with them. 
So embodied simulation not only connects us to others, it connects us to our world, a world inhabited by natural objects, man-made objects, with or without symbolic nature, and other individuals, a world in which most of the time, if, if things go smoothly, we feel at home, not necessarily. So the experience of architecture, from the contemplation of the decorative element of a Greek temple to the physical experience of living and working within a specific architectonic space, can be unpacked, deconstructed into its bodily grounding elements, or at least <coughs> this is the hope. The constant weighting of architectonic and peripersonal space is mainly processed by premotor neurons mapping visual space on potential action or motor schemata. Cognitive neuroscience can investigate what the sense of presence of a building is made of. This approach can also contribute a fresher empirical take on the evolution of architectonic style and its cultural diversity. Viewed as a particular case of symbolic expression, can we revitalize Scully perspective? This is a question mark. Uh, I don't really know, but at least one could try using this particular uh, framework by looking for their body roots. And again, people had similar ideas in the past. Adolf von Hildebrand, a sculpture, not a very good one in my humble opinion, but a great theoretician. Creation and response to art are directly related. To understand an artistic image means to implicitly grasp its creative process. Space does not constitute an a priori of experience, as suggested by Kant, but its product. Artistic images are effectual, that is, are the outcome of both the artist's creative production and of the effects images produce on beholders. And we have uh, demonstrated that empirically uh, with uh, the cuts on canvas uh, by Lucio Fontana and the brushstroke of Franz Klein. I have no time to talk about those experiments today. Through movement, the available elements in space can be connected. Objects can be carved out of their background and perceived as such. Through movement, representations and meaning can be formed and articulated. We can provide uh, an empirical backup uh, by looking at the function of the brain to this uh, theoretical statement. The role of embodied simulation in architectural experience becomes even more interesting if one considers emotions and sensations the optic quality of materials, for example, the colors. Uh, conclusion, because I'm running out of time. Embodied simulation can shed light on human symbolic expression, both from the point of view of its making and of its experience. In so doing, it reveals the intimate, intersubjective nature of any creative act, leaving behind our uh, idea of a solipsistic, uh, uh, cogitating mind. More than the cogito, I think the phenomenologist got it right. Uh, more than I, I, I think is relevant here, the I can, ich kann. The physical object, the outcome of symbolic expression, becomes the mediator of an intersubjective relationship between creator and beholder. And body simulation generates the peculiar quality of the embodied scene has that plays a significant role in aesthetic experience. That's my hypothesis. And it is therefore one important ingredient of our appreciation of human symbolic expression it is in its multifarious uh, declination. And I'll finish with a quote from August Schmasso. Every spatial creation is first and foremost the enclosing of a subject. In order to understand the subject, we cannot leave the body out of the picture. Thank you so much.